First Samuel chapter 21. So last time we saw that uh, Jonathan and David in their covenant with each other, uh, David says, you know, Saul, Saul really does want to kill me. And, and so Jonathan works with him a plan to find out for sure if that's really what Saul wants to do. And they determine, yes, that is what Saul is trying to do. And so, so Jonathan helps David to know and to escape and and so David runs. And tonight we're going to talk about what happens when you get in the flesh. You know, you've got, a, you've got a, a choice every day of your life that you can either walk in the flesh or you can walk in the Spirit. Every day, throughout the day, every time you react or act in, in any situation, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have these two opposing forces in you. You've got your old flesh pulling you one way, and you've got the Spirit of God leading you in a good and godly way. And so, <clears throat> so what we're going to see is, is David is going to, he's going to get in the flesh here. Now he's, he's learned that Saul wants to kill him. And he's determined in his heart that he's not going to fight against Saul. He's not going to try to take the kingdom even though it rightly belongs to him. And so it says uh, <clears throat> in chapter 22, I'm sorry, chapter 21, verse 1. Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? So Ahimelech is a little bit suspicious. David, he's the king's son-in-law, and, and he's not completely alone. He does have some guys with him, some young men with him, but uh, he doesn't have, he's, he's not in a royal entourage. He's not, he doesn't have the other soldiers with him. Uh, Abner's not there or, or someone like that that would be a, a, a part of a military uh, contingent. And so, so Ahimelech, he, he questions him. And David said unto Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what there is present. So here's the first thing I think we see whenever you get in the flesh. David, he runs from Saul and he is uh, having a, a, a wrong witness. David's telling lies. that This is not true. Saul has not sent him on a mission. Um, he's running. But he, he's, not, he's not telling the truth. And so he's got this. He's, I think it's, he's at a point where he really doesn't know exactly what to do. And he's trying to figure out. And so he, he goes to Nob. He goes to Ahimelech. And he asks for bread. And so <clears throat> he says, uh, verse 3, Now therefore what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand. Or what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread. For there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. So uh, David asked for food and the priest says, the only thing I have here is the showbread. So apparently after the ark was taken in battle by the Philistines, uh, the tabernacle at that point in time was at Shiloh. And so now apparently they've moved the tabernacle to Nob, uh, which is north of Jerusalem. And they are carrying on their priestly ministry in the absence of the tabernacle uh, because it's at somebody else's house. <laughs> and so, uh, so it, he's got the showbread laid out. And this was, this was a part of the tabernacle ministry on the table. They would bake 12 loaves of bread and it would sit there and it would be changed out every week. And so Ahimelech says, the only thing I have is this showbread. And he says, he says, but... The only way that I can give this to you is if the young men are holy, if they've kept themselves from women. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20 real quick. And uh, <clears throat> let's look at the giving of the law. Maybe in, I'm sorry, 19. Exodus chapter 19. Just as a reminder, it says there in chapter 19 verse 7, Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord... Uh, hath spoken, we will do. Moses turned the words of the people unto the Lord. The Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. Moses told the words to the people. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever, yeah, whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. Verse 13, There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. And so, once again, we, we see this. Uh, in, in order for the people to approach the tabernacle, or in that case, to approach the mount where God was going to be giving the law, he had said, I want you to remain uh, abstinent for two or three days beforehand in that situation. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 7 real quick. And we're chasing a rabbit here, but um, it's, it's just a, it seems a curiosity to me. Seems one of those things I kind of wanted to look up and, and think about a little bit. Why did Ahimelech say that the men needed to be hallowed in that particular regard. Well, that was, that was apparently something that was required of the people coming to approach the Lord, coming to approach the tabernacle, okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5, it says there, <clears throat> he says... Uh, uh, let's start in verse 1. Now concerning the things wherever you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband not hath power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And so, <clears throat> so even, even in the New Testament setting, the Bible says that a man and his wife ought to uh, love each other, sleep together, and that they shouldn't defraud one another in that regard, except it be an agreement with them for the purpose of fasting and prayer. So certain situations and instances of life that somebody might need to really seek God's will or something, a couple might decide, hey, we need, to, we need to really focus on this. Or the circumstances of life might be so dire that a man and wife not sleeping a whole lot anyway because things are so tough and they're fasting and praying and working their way through that. So we see this throughout Scripture. So the priest says, you got to keep, you, these, I can't give you this bread unless you are, are in, you're on a holy mission which David's lying about that, and the fact that the young men, that they have, let's see how he said it there, something about their vessel. Of a truth, verse 5, women have been kept from us these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy. The vessels, what's he talking about? He's talking about your body. The Bible always uses the term of a vessel to talk about your physical body. First Corinthians chapter, or sorry, First Thessalonians chapter four talks about how to to maintain your vessel in sanctification and honor, and and so that same mentality, the body. These young men are holy. Let's turn to uh, Matthew chapter twelve because Jesus is going to use this particular story as an illustration in his day. So this is a big deal, the fact that, that Ahimelech gave David this bread. Nobody has ever eaten this bread except David and his young men that isn't a priest. This bread was to be consumed by the priests. It was made specifically for use in the tabernacle. It was laid on the table of showbread, and the priests ate it after it had been on the table for however long, a week, I think, and then, uh, but they were the only ones that ate it, except in this instance. So why did Ahimelech give David the bread, and was it a sin? Well, Matthew chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. And his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. 
And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. See, the, the traditions of the elders taught that if you took the heads of grain and put them in your hand and did like this, that you were threshing wheat. So to separate the heads from the, the shaft, from the stalk, and from the burrs, the beards, and then to eat that raw grain to the Pharisee, you just did work on the Sabbath day. And so this is their charge that they're, they're ha, ha, you know, they're following Jesus around. Aha, we found you sinning, right? But here's his answer to them, verse 3. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was in hunger, and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Isn't that interesting? So Jesus says it was okay for David to do what he did, and it was okay for him to do what he was doing. So why was it okay for David to eat that showbread, even though that showbread was to only be eaten by the priests? And here's where we have something that, that you know, I think should probably just, just make common sense to us, but we've got it laid out for us in Scripture, and that is showing mercy. Showing mercy. When somebody's hungry, uh, you should give them something to eat, even if it's the, the hallowed showbread there in the temple. And so you've, kinda, you, you've got certain things, and there were a lot of these things in Israel. For instance, let's say your baby boy was born, and it, you counted out eight days, and he was supposed to be... Uh, circumcised on the eighth day but it just so happened that the eighth day was a Saturday now what do you do well <clears throat> it's more important to go ahead and circumcise that boy on the eighth day than it is to you, you got two laws that you're trying to to fulfill I want to keep the Sabbath day by not doing any work and I want to circumcise my son one of those laws becomes light and one heavy in that regard that's the way the Jews measured those kind of things or, for instance, let's say it's the Sabbath day and you're on your way to church. Eh, they wouldn't have been going to church. You're on your way to the synagogue. And uh, you go along and you look out there and your neighbor's ox is in the ditch. And he's bogged down in the mud and he's out and the gate's open. And you look around, you don't see your neighbor anywhere. And you know you're going to be late to the, to the synagogue if you stop. So what do you do? Do you go off and leave your neighbor's ox there out where he could get run over by somebody else's ox cart on the way to, to, Sabbath, uh, to uh, uh, synagogue? Or... Or what, what did you do? Well, you should help him. You should put the ox back in or take him to your house. Get him some feed or whatever. And so, so once again, you got light and heavy. And what we learn here is, is that showing mercy is always a priority. Uh, giving somebody some food, like the Good Samaritan. Helping somebody out that's in a, a time of need. This is always something that's appropriate to do. And so Himalek gives them the bread. Uh, it says there in verse 7, Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. So, why he was detained, we don't know exactly. Uh, maybe he was in an unclean situation. Uh, maybe he'd come into contact with a leper, and he's having to make sure that the priest is going to okay him to go back into the, the population. I don't know exactly what the deal is, but his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul. So he's one of Saul's herdsmen. He's an Edomite, but he is living in Israel, working for Saul, presumably uh, worshiping Israel's God because he's there at the tabernacle, okay? And so Doeg is there and just mentions this in passing. We're going to find out more about the significance of this as we continue on. So the first thing we see here is, is, is as David is walking in the flesh, he, is, he has the wrong witness. He's, he's lying about his mission and he's being deceptive as he talks to Ahimelech. The second thing that we're going to see uh, that happens whenever you uh, um, are in the flesh is you're going to use the wrong kind of weapons. And so look here at verse 8. It says, And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there <clears throat> not here under thine hand a spear or a sword? Now, if you're on a special mission directly from the king and you are the guy who has slain tens of thousands, um, it's kind of doesn't it's kind of fishy that you don't have a weapon with you is it not and so Ahimelech once again is going what he says do you have a spear or a sword here for I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste so once again he's he's lying he's he's just making up a, a fib and it says and the priest said the sword of Goliath the Philistine 
whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is no other save that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it me. So now I want you to think about this. Remember when David faced Goliath. Remember what he, he went to Saul and he said, I'll fight the Philistine, right? What did Saul do? Saul offered him his armor and weapons, which David tried. And they were too big for him. The, the armor didn't fit. The sword was the sword for a man, and David was a little boy, and he turned them all down. He said, I can't face him with these. These are untested by me in battle. They don't fit. He turned them down. He used his sling. He defeated the giant. Then he lopped off his head once he had him dead and down with his own sword. But now he's more than happy to take the sword of his enemy, which he's never used in battle. I find that fascinating, and I think... You know, some people make this out to be spiritual, but I don't think it's spiritual at all. I think David is compromising here. I think David is choosing the wrong kind of weapons because he's in the flesh. So let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 real quick. Now let's think about weapons. <clears throat> the sword of Goliath, you know, swords, they have names, they have purposes, they are given at certain times, and, you know, they have great significance in lives a lot of times, and... Uh, for entire nations, families, and, and so a sword is something that's very recognizable, especially this one. Uh, all of Israel would have recognized the sword of Goliath, and so, uh, so would all of the Philistines. But the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Well, wh what I think as we read chapter 21 is, is I think David is warring after the flesh. He's, he's walking in the wrong witness. He's lying about his mission, and he's, 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 he's just kind of kind of making it up as he goes. Number two, I think he's warring with the wrong weapons. He's willing to take Goliath's sword, which he's never been willing to use before. But the Bible says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, we don't war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You see, I think David is choosing a carnal weapon here by taking Goliath's sword. He is not on a mission where he can trust God because he's not being led by God at this point. God has not told him to run away from Saul in this manner. God has not told him to go to Ahimelech. God has not told him to go where he's about to go next. And so he's, he's walking in the flesh. Well, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know, when you are engaged in the warfare and you're engaged in the spiritual warfare, you're going to be using spiritual weapons. When David first faced Goliath, he went with what he knew. He went with his experience, with his sling, with a handful of stones from the crick. He said, this was what I used with the lion. This is what I used with the bear. This is what I know, and God will give me the victory. I'm not going to have the victory because of my military prowess i'm going to have the victory because god's going to give it to me but now he's changed his gears a little bit now he's like i need a sword any sword what do you got oh well that'll do there's none like that that's for sure so david straps on a carnal weapon verse 10 it says and david arose and he fled that day for fear of saul now wait a minute where did that come from David hasn't been afraid of Saul throughout this whole thing, but now all of a sudden he is. So once again, this is what happens when you get in the flesh. You stop making your decisions based on faith, and you start making your decisions based on fear. The Bible tells us God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But David's not thinking right. That can be found in 2 Timothy 1.7, I believe, is uh, where that passage of Scripture is. And, and I want you to remember that part about the sound mind because <clears throat> we're going to see, yeah, 2 Timothy 1, 7. Power, love, and a sound mind. So we're going to see David is going to have to feign that he has lost his mind to get out of the mess that him walking in the flesh is going to get for him. And so out of fear of Saul, he runs. So the first thing I think that, that we see when you walk in the flesh is is that you have the wrong witness. You just, you're just telling fibs, you're telling lies, you're making it up as you go along. Number two, I think what you see is, is you're going to use the wrong weapons. You're going to forsake 
the, the weapons that God has given us, prayer and, and uh, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and you're going you're gonna to go and you're going to pick up a carnal weapon, you, even a big, mighty one like, like Goliath's sword, but, but you're going you're gonna to do that. The third thing I think you're going to see is going to happen is you're going to walk in the world. You're going to begin to walk in the world. Instead of uh, uh, walking in the Spirit, instead of being led by God, you're going to go back to the world. And it says, He fled for fear that day, for fear of Saul, and went to Achish, the king of Gath. <laughs> uh, I just, I, 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 someday in heaven, I'm going to say, God, can I go watch the reruns? And I want to see this. I want to see David and this small handful of guys with some showbread in their, in their knapsack. And him with Goliath's sword on. By the way, where was Goliath from? Gath. <laughs> Can't you see? Here comes David. David has slain his thousands. and Or Saul has slain his thousands. And David is ten thousands. He's killed tens of thousands of these people. He killed their mighty champion. He lopped off the champion's head with this sword. He's got this sword strapped on. And he comes walking into Gath. Here I am, boys. I'm changing teams. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't think that uh, his reception was probably a very good one. Do you? I'm, I'm thinking they probably, well, I, I'm thinking, well, I just don't know what it was. They're, first of all, they're scared to death of him because he's deadly. Now he's got packing around Goliath's sword, but they all hate him. They can't stand him. I mean, he's a number one, enemy number one for them. And so it says, The servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Oh, that's interesting. You know, this reminds me of Rahab here. When the spies went into Rahab's house, Rahab said, God's put the fear of us in you. We know that you're going to take this land. We know what's going to happen. We don't like it, but we know it. And they know that David's the king. Or maybe they don't know. They just think that he is because he's so powerful and because he's such a leader and because he's so deadly to their their forces but i find that fascinating you know sometimes the enemy it, it, it happened all the time in jesus's ministry he'd be confronting a demon and they'd be like we know who you are we know exactly who you are don't send us to the abyss yet you know the the demon the legion that were in the 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 crazy man and these philistines they say this he's the king of the land what's he doing here did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul is slain his thousands and David is ten thousands? They know exactly who he is. And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he's, he's afraid of Saul, so he runs to Gath. He gets to Gath. He realizes what he's done. You see, David's not in his right mind. He's walking in the world. He's walking in the flesh. He's, he's got a wrong witness. He's got the wrong weapons. He's walking in the world, and he is wandering from the Lord. And this is the fourth thing that will happen to you when you get in the flesh he's wandering away he's wandered outside the bounds of israel he's wandered into the enemy camp and it's not until he gets in the enemy camp that he realizes ruh -ruh. <laughs> it, it's almost as if well he's just not in his right mind he's just not thinking right remember god has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind david is not thinking properly and this could have got him killed pretty easily. <clears throat> so Saul's trying to pin him to the wall with a javelin back at his place. Now he just marched into Philistine territory, packing Goliath's sword. And all of a sudden, once he's there in the middle of it, he goes, Hey, boys, I don't think <laughs> this was such a good plan. You know, this, this is just, well, it's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. And it says in verse 13, here's his way out of it. He changed his behavior before them, and he feigned himself mad in their hands. And scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. So he picked up a crayon and he went over and he's muttering and slobbering on himself and he's coloring on the on the doors of the of the gate, trying to make them think that he's crazy. Which they buy, because you'd have to be crazy to come marching into the Philistine camp with Goliath's sword and think that you were in your right mind. So he, this is his only way out, or so he can see. Can you see that none of this is spiritual? None of this is led by God. He is not of a sound mind at this point in time. He's having to act like he's insane. And, uh, you know, the Native Americans, just like most Eastern peoples, uh, they, would not, they would not do harm to someone who was insane. They kind of had a, a, a fear of them. They, 
they allowed them to live amongst them and they provided for them and took care of them because they, they thought they were touched in some way. And, and so this is the only answer David can think of as to why the future king of Israel would be <laughs> fleeing to Gath uh, with just a handful of guys with him um, and be right in the middle of them. And so he acts like he's crazy. Verse 14, then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, you see, the man is mad. Wherefore then have you brought him to me? Have I need of madmen, that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? And so <clears throat> Achish is going to spare his life, and David's going to escape from there. He's going to flee. Verse 1 of chapter 22 says, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Now, right in between these two chapters, actually as David is in the cave of Dullam, there are two psalms that we know that come out of this time. And so I want to look at those by way of closing. And so the first one is Psalm 57. If you want to turn there with me, <clears throat> Psalm 57. I love it when you can track these down and find out exactly when these psalms were, were written uh, because it, the, the context really helps you understand so it says there, Psalm 57, to the chief musician, uh, uh, Altashith, Miktam of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave. Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. You see, David now is changing. Instead of running away and walking in the world and wandering from the Lord, now He's coming back to God, and we see this taking place in his life. And so I like, to, I like to think about, you know, from the time you get saved to the time you get born again until you go to be in glory or until Jesus comes to get us, you know, you're, you should be on an upward path, right? You should be from being lost to being saved and then from being saved to, to learning to walk with Jesus. The only problem is, is that path many times looks like this, and it goes like a, a family circus, like the little boy on family circus when he's coming home from school, you know, and it just tracks all over the playground, up the tree and under the culvert and all of that. That, that unfortunately, but honestly, is what our path of following Jesus looks like. And that's what David's looks like. And so we can learn from this. So he's praying for God's mercy. I will cry unto God most high. What did he go to the cave for? Well, he needs to hide, but he needs to hide in God instead of hiding in the Philistine world out there. And so he says, I'll cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Selah. Yeah, God just saved him. Uh, he had to act like he was crazy because he was crazy for being in the middle of the Philistines. And uh, he says, God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. Don't you know that's exactly how David felt? There you stand with nothing but Goliath's sword right in the middle of the city of Gath going... Wow, how did I get here? These people hate me, all right? He says, my soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. This is what David has experienced. He's hated by Saul, and Saul has put out word that they, want, they should kill David on sight. He, the Philistines can't stand him either. This is what he feels like. But then he says in verse 5, be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. And so now he's coming to a place where he's worshiping God. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are following themselves. Selah. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up my glory. Awake, sultry and harp. I myself will awake early. See, he's changing. Instead of running, instead of being in fear, He's putting his focus back on God. And this is my challenge to us tonight. You know, <clears throat> all of us get in these, these times and places where, where we are confused, where we, it, it doesn't look like uh, we've got a whole lot of options. But instead of running to the world to gath, we need to go to the cave of Dullam. We need to go get alone and get with God and, and get our mind right, get our heart right, and get, get our, our compass fixed back where it needs to be. He says, verse 9, I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. One more psalm, and then we're done. Psalm 142. 142. 
Both of these psalms, we, based on their titles, we know were written <clears throat> while he was in the cave. It says, Maskeel of David, a prayer when he was in the cave. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Philippians 4, 6 says. That's what David is doing. He says, I, 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 I got, I'm, I'm getting back to God. So, so can you see the, the difference? Chapter 21 is all about going away from God into the world, into uh, the, the, the city of the Philistines with the wrong weapons and, and, and the wrong motives and everything wrong. These psalms are about getting back to where God wants you to be. And you get alone and you get with the Lord and you cry out to Him. He says, I poured out my complaint before Him. I showed before Him my trouble. God, here's what's going on. God, I don't know what to do. I need wisdom. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then Thou knewest my path. You see, had, God, or had David asked for his path before he headed for Nob, before he headed for Gath, he might have taken a little different course. He might have gone straight to this cave and have avoided a whole bunch of real heartache. And there's more heartache to come. But he says, In the way wherein I walked, have they privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand, and behold... But there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I don't know if you've ever felt like that before, but David felt like he was absolutely and completely alone. No man was going to help him. The Philistines weren't going to help him. Saul wasn't going to help him. Jonathan's hands were tied. He couldn't help him. He'd helped him by warning him and letting him escape. But other than that, there wasn't a whole lot he could do. And David felt like he was completely alone. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion. In the land of the living. You see, God's the refuge. Where do you hide? You hide in the Lord. The Lord, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are safe. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Now look at, look at the change that's happened. From, from lying to the priest to the last verse of Psalm 142, David has gone just like a, just like a yo-yo. I mean, he went whoop, as far away from God as he could get, and he gets brought right back in. And, and the, the way that he got back in was to go hide in a cave, go get on his face before the Lord, cry out to the Lord, and talk to God in prayer. And I just want to encourage you tonight, that's how you get out of the world the flesh and the snares of the devil is exactly that same way, just like David did. And so I love, I love, I love David. I love the stories of David in, the, in 1st and 2nd Samuel. I, I love to, to see the way that God lays this all out for us because there's so much that we can learn from it. And I just want to encourage you tonight. <clears throat> carnal weapons, they are a waste of time. They're vanity. Uh, carnal ways and means going to the world for answers. The, these things, you know, don't trust in the legs of man or in the strength of the horse, but trust in the name of the Lord God. He's there. He's always there. If you'll cry out to him, he will help you. He will rescue you. He'll bring you out of prison, just like David says there. And uh, that's, that's a, a comforting thought to me. Father, we love you and praise you, and we thank you for the word of God. Thank you for this time of study tonight and Lord we just uh, all of us are tempted Lord to walk in the world to walk in the flesh to wander away from you but Lord I pray that we would take the path of the cave of Adullam that we would go and hide and get right with you and get on your path and let you lead us help us to make the right decisions the wise decisions your word says that you give wisdom and that you give it without upbraiding, and you give it liberally, Lord, and we just thank you for that. We need it on a daily basis, Lord. We praise you tonight. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. I'm glad you're here.